Well, thank you very much um, to the organizers, Eberhard Jort and Ivo, for the invitation to participate in this uh, very important EAA session. Okay, so I want to address uh, how archaeological survey methodologies and regional analysis more broadly can build upon these rather static and two-dimensional historical geographies of Hittite imperialism in late Bronze Age Anatolia. Um, this particular map shows a typically Hatti-centric view of South Central Anatolia, um, which will incidentally be the focus of my talk a little further east than most of the papers today. In, in this slide, uh, well, is based, the map is based mostly on Hittite edicts, prayers, and peace treaties signed between the kings of Hatti and Tarantasha. So the shift in perspective is uh, also, of course, a disciplinary shift because it relies more heavily on archaeological forms of data and analysis from the provinces and frontiers of Hatti rather than on the text corpora from the imperial capital. One good example of an archaeologically defined frontier was identified in the Project Paphlagonia survey in north central Turkey, where it soon became clear to Roger Matthews and his team that the survey area straddled the northern boundary of Hatti. The surveys identified a network of fortifications, not unlike the Great Wall of China or Hadrian's Wall in Britain which defended Hatti from incursions and attacks from the people the Hittites called the Kaska. In this paper, I will address a different frontier uh, to the south of Hatti in a region that the Hittites refer to as the Lower Land. The southern frontier of Hatti is different from the northern one for a number of related reasons. The southern frontier was more permeable. One consequence of the cultural and political permeability of the southern frontier is the extensive and diverse evidence for interactions between Hatti and the lower land. For example, there are Luvian inscribed monuments in the lower land, including this monument of Korunta that I've shown on the slide and which I will refer, return to again in this talk. There are, of course, no such monuments in the Costa frontier. Hatti appears to have annexed the lower land no later than Telepinu at the beginning of the 15th century. And it is well known that Muotali II briefly moved the Hittite capital <coughs> to the lower land uh, when he established his reign at Tarantasha. And I should be clear that I'm following, or we're following, for Lenini here in equating uh, or um, recognizing Tarantasha and the Lower Land to be interchangeable, certainly by the end of the 13th century BC. I'll return to that point again. Like Amarna and Akhenaten in Egypt, uh, the capital status of Tarantasha would not outlive its visionary founder, but unlike Amarna, Tarantasha continued to exist as a powerful political entity after the Hittite capital was moved back to Hattusha. Tarantasha would indeed become a regional adversary of Hatti for the remainder of the 13th century. Landscape monuments in South Central Anatolia are widely believed to reflect tensions between Hattusha and Tarantasha in the latter half of the 13th century. The squares on this map identify late Bronze Age landscape monuments and Luvian inscriptions. Um, the circles identify Iron Age ones, so you can ignore the Iron Age ones for the purposes of this paper. The inscribed late Bronze Age monuments are associated with one of two individuals who both proclaimed themselves great king. Tudali IV, who was great king of Hatti, and his contemporary and cousin, Kurunta, who was vice regent and great king at Tarantasha. So 
So many have argued that the epithet Great King was traditionally reserved for the one and only Hittite King. By proclaiming himself Great King in this monument, Karunta is represented as an equal and a rival to his cousin Tutalia. So the last decades of the 13th century BC, the lower land appears to have become a southern frontier of Hatti. Evidence both analytically in Hittite records of military campaigns against Tarantasha and in the landscape monuments of the two contemporary great kings. The landscape monuments reveal a contested socio-political landscape in South Central Anatolia and feature in my conjectural rendering of a borderland between Hatti and the lower land on this map. Again, not haughty so much as the um, a more of the Hittite Empire, if we can call it that. So again, following Forlanini, we note that Tarantasha and the lower land are geographically associated with the Haluya River, uh, which can only be the Charshamba River, which is, of course, the main river that defines the alluvial plain, which is the Konya Plain. So again, in the last centuries of the 13th century BC, we argue that Tarantasha and the lower land can be used interchangeably. The lower land did not emerge out of the blue in the late Bronze Age. For the remainder of this talk, I will present data from the Konya Regional Archaeological Survey Project to make a few broad brushstroke observations on the emergence of this political economic entity. I'll focus on two kinds of data represented in the maps on the slide. The development of a regional network of fortifications that you see represented on the left, and a number of settlement pattern trends in the Konya Plain. Orographic landscapes are the penultimate margin in any period of human history. In the Bronze Age, the mountains, volcanoes, and Piedmont that enclosed the Konya Plain were transformed into a defensible barrier. This process began already in the last centuries of the third millennium BC, or towards the end of the early Bronze Age, with the earliest attestations of hilltop fortifications in the Konya Plain, mostly in the south. By the late Bronze Age, the Konya Plain was entirely encircled in a defensive network which included mostly hilltop fortresses, but perhaps also fortified settlement sites in the alluvial plain, like Buig, Ashlamahuyuk, which I've indicated there, um, ah, there it is, uh, with the star. So again, you can see the mountain tops, or the, the, the orographic landscapes surrounding most of the plain, but not to the east. Um, uh, we'll see Buig, Ashlamahuyuk in a second, and, and explain why we think this might be a fortified citadel, perhaps guarding that eastern approach to the plain. So with a grant from Luvian Studies, we are implementing aerial survey methodologies to visualize and analyze fortified hilltops in our survey area. I've included three of them on this slide, all founded in the Middle Bronze Age and prominent in the Late Bronze Age defensive network. The ortho photo of Kinikalesi on the upper left um, was generated in our drone survey in 2019 and shows a surprisingly crowded architectural plan for a fortress. Again, we have to imagine that this is on top of a, a prominent uh, hilltop, um, that image on the left, upper left. Uh, more drone produced images uh, from our 2019 surveys are currently in process. I'm sorry I don't have them now. Uh, I've shown here instead some Google Earth images of other prominent fortresses. Uh, again, that form part of that defensive cordon, if you will, around the Konya Plain. So not surprisingly, the Konya Plain was densely settled in the Bronze Age with settlement patterns and settlement sizes that more closely resemble Upper Mesopotamia than the rest of the Anatolian Peninsula. For example, already in the early Bronze Age, we recorded three 
30 hectare sites. And by the Middle Bronze Age, we've recorded six sites that are between 30 and 40 hectares in size, um, shown in the stars on the left. And of course, the only, the only excavated or partially excavated Bronze Age site in the Kony Plain is Kony Karahuyuk, um, which is a part of the, uh, this Middle Bronze Age picture. So the parallels between Kony Karahuyuk and the more extensively excavated and better known and better published, I should say, um, Kultepe Kanesh and Hajimahuyuk, i.e. these other Middle Bronze Age palaces, suggest to many that a Karum may have existed at Kony Karahuyuk. Um, however, there have been no excavations in the lower town to um, prove or disprove this hypothesis. Uh, nevertheless, like all other major Middle Bronze Age sites in the central plateau with Karums, um, Karahui Konya or Konya Karahui was also violently destroyed and abandoned at the end of the Middle Bronze Age. When, if we look to the map on the right, um, it appears the, uh, there was a shift, let's say, a political shift towards the east. Um, uh, where another center emerged at Turkmen Karahuyuk, um, which we've indicated with the square on the right. <clears throat> the upper mound and lower town of late Bronze Age Turkmen Karahuyuk is a staggering 120 hectares in size, or three times larger than the next largest Bronze Age settlement in the Konya Plain. Turkmen Karahuyuk is of obvious interest to us, and as of 2019, uh, the site has been the focus of an intensive survey led by our colleague James Osborne from the University of Chicago, who is working under the aegis of our regional survey. Uh, stay tuned for the results of the first season of the Turkmen Karahuyuk intensive survey project, uh, which will include more sophisticated site maps and presentations of data that I'm showing here. Incidentally, uh, the results of this survey, which are quite astounding, um, will be presented in Europe for the first time at Akane. Another large late Bronze Age site is located only six kilometers to the east of Turkmen Karahuyuk. Uh, Buyuk Ashlabahuyuk is one of the five 30 plus hectare late Bronze Age settlements in the Konya Plain. Notable morphological features of Buyuk Ashlamahuyuk include a very steep and pronounced upper mound visible in both the photograph uh, and in the uh, digital elevation model image above. Um, because the site is located so close to its much larger neighbor, uh, we are toying with the idea that the site serves some specialized purpose. Um, perhaps, as I had said earlier, perhaps as some sort of fortified citadel guarding the eastern approach to the Konya Plain uh, and, and basically closing the gap in that ring of hilltop fortifications around the Konya Plain. So we conducted drone surveys at Buyuk Ashla and um, in 2019 as well. And here the drone produced a digital elevation model shows another very intriguing feature. Uh, a subsurface feature that you can see there as that linear line over 100 meters in length over nine meters thick, and it appears to have these sort of buttresses. So our preliminary interpretation of this structure is that it is a dam uh, and part of a centralized water management project, not unlike the recently excavated Hittite Dam at Kushakla, so does. Uh, larger settlement patterns in the Konya Plain also relate to water management strategies, or so we believe. Uh, the map on the left shows the clustering of settlements in the Tershamba alluvium uh, prior to the late Bronze Age. Uh, and the map on the right shows this northern sort of proliferation of sites into what are very arid, very marginal steppe landscapes in uh, beginning in the early Bronze Age and continuing on through the middle and late Bronze Age. In the, the early Bronze Age sites, you can see those uh, yellow triangles. Uh, and the remainder of those going up into these arid uh, steppe landscapes are um, later Bronze Age and Iron Age sites. Uh, incidentally, the dotted maps, uh, dotted lines on the map are canal 
systems today, i.e. irrigation canals that are being used in the Colonial Plain today, and you can see that these um, modern irrigation canals connect a lot of those sites that go down through um, uh, the arid uh, steppe landscape down towards the Tarshan Baluvi. And again, supporting our hypothesis that there was indeed large-scale irrigation happening certainly by the second millennium in the Konya Plain. Um, so we believe the onset of coordinated large-scale irrigation strategies partly explains this histogram. Um, now, uh, if, if the total acreage of archaeological sites can be used as a proxy for uh, populations, for demographic trends, where the blue bar represents total inhabited areas in the Colonial Plain, and the red represents the total inhabited area of the largest sites from each period, the histogram shows the most pronounced spike in the transition from the Middle Bronze Age to the Late Bronze Age. So, the onset of Hittite hegemony in the Kony Plain likely included the implementation of large-scale centralized irrigation and farming strategies with consequences for the demographic trends that we are trying to represent on this histogram. Sorry, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, so with these broad brush strokes, I've painted an image of an urbanizing early state in the Konya Plain in the second millennium BC within a territory that the Hittites refer to as the Lower Land. Now at this stage, uh, I remain skeptical of using the term Luvian to describe anything other than a language, or indeed, uh, of course, to, inscribe, to describe this particular political entity as Luvian. Um, I believe terms like Luvian, Hittite, Hurrian, or even Mycenaean for that matter, essentialize and, and ultimately oversimplify the richly complex archaeological landscape that is Late Bronze Age Anatolia. I do not believe there's any such thing as Luvian pottery, pottery or even Hittite pottery. Yet, as archaeologists of Late Bronze Age Anatolia, we need to be able to conceptualize large-scale geographical entities that exist beyond the boundaries of Hatti. The Konya Plain is a well-defined social, spatial, and political entity where a number of spatial and temporal trends have converged in the emergence of a territorial state in the second millennium BC. We are not ready to call the Konya Plain the land of Luvia, but it is likely, a likely candidate for this one-off reference in the Hittite laws to a place inhabited by Luvian speakers. It is worth considering how future excavations on any one of the massive late Bronze Age sites in the Konya Plain might inform this problem. Thank you very much. <laughs>